Cynthia Bergeau, in her book, The Wisdom Way of Knowing, uh, she writes this parable about a kingdom of acorns and a strange little visitor. And I want to begin by, by reading this parable because to those that are paying attention, it's not going to be just a summary of what I'm saying in this session, but it's a summary of the series of videos so far. Cynthia Bergeau writes this. She says, Once upon a time... In a not-so-far-away land, there was a kingdom of acorns nestled at the foot of a grand old oak tree. Since the citizens of this kingdom were modern, fully westernized acorns, they went about their business with purposeful energy. And since they were midlife baby boomer acorns, they engaged in a, a lot of self-help courses. There were seminars calling, called Getting All You Can Out of Your Shell, there were woundedness and recovery groups for acorns who had been bruised in their original fall from the tree. There were spas for oiling and polishing their shells and, and various acornopathic therapies to enhance longevity and well-being. But one day, in the midst of this kingdom, there suddenly appeared a little stranger filled with knots. Apparently dropped out of the blue by a passing bird, he was capless and dirty, making an immediate impression on his fellow acorns. And crouched beneath the oak tree, he stammered out a wild tale. Pointing upward at the tree, he said, We are that. Delusional thinking, obviously, the other acorns concluded. But one of them continued to engage him in conversation, so tell us, how would we become that tree? Well, he said, pointing downward, it has something to do with going into the ground and cracking open the shell. Insane, they responded. Totally morbid, they laughed. Why? Then we wouldn't be acorns anymore. You know, I've only had an audience laugh at me one time. Uh, one time in all of my speaking engagements and in all of the different venues, I've only had an audience laugh at me one time. Not, not at a joke, not at some story that I, that I told, but laugh at me one time. It was in Colorado and I was speaking at this youth conference of about a thousand high schoolers and and, you know, at the beginning, I kind of told some playful stories and some, some images on the screen, and we were having a good time. And then I came close to the middle of my sermon, and I said, okay, let me just go ahead and tell you exactly what I'm going to say tonight. Here's my main point. The main point of the whole sermon is stop sinning. Immediately, they started laughing at me. And I said, no, 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 I... I'm serious. Stop sinning. And then it got awkwardly quiet. And I, 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 I suppose that what they were thinking was, he can't be serious. I mean, as a matter of fact, I even had somebody come up to me after the sermon and they say, like, you didn't mean, like, really actually stop sinning, did you? And I was like, oh, no, I, I meant stop sinning. You see, the reason why that's somewhat of a difficulty is because in some sense, we think that sinning is a necessary reality of being human. That sin is part of what makes us whole. But let me ask a couple of questions in response. Should we embrace sin? I mean, should we welcome sin as a guest into our home? Should we grant sin permission to eat at our table with us? Because there's a part of that that just seems a bit strange. You know what, though? At the risk of you laughing at the screen right now, I'm going to say to you the same thing I said to the audience in Colorado. Here is my point for this session. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. I, I, I know that that isn't a very popular statement. 
especially in the evangelical circles where the seeker-sensitive movement has taken root. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was at a church uh, several years ago, and, and I was sitting in the audience, and their, their senior minister got up on stage, and he was giving announcements, and then at one point he said, Sin, hey man, it's cool, we're all sinners here. Even though I'm the preacher, I'm just like you. I'm not holier than you or, or more perfect than you. I'm just a sinner like everybody else. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, pff, that's depressing. I mean, seriously? <laughs> that's really depressing to me. Why? I mean, because in some sense, I mean, I, I, I know what he was trying to do. He was trying to be relatable. He was trying to look at the person and say, Everyone is welcome here. At the foot of the cross, everyone is welcome. And listen to me, I completely agree with that. But in his attempt to be relatable, he actually says something quite appalling. Because really what the minister says is, even though I've been doing this Christian thing for a really long time, even more long than you've been alive, and even though I'm a freak about it because I'm the preacher, nothing about me has really changed. I'm really no different than whenever I first started. I'm not more like Jesus. I'm just just like you, which to me is quite depressing. Because in my moments, whenever I struggle with holiness, what gives me hope is that someday this will be different. That someday, through the transformation of the Holy Spirit, that sin will become a distant memory, that I won't always have to be an acorn. But according to this guy, apparently that's not true. Now listen, hey, listen, I get it. I do. Christ is the only one that's perfect, not you, not me. But if we're the body of Christ, our actions shouldn't differ from his that drastically. I mean, if we're the hands and feet of Jesus, I would think that the way that we live in some sense reflects and looks a lot like him. Otherwise, what are we doing? I mean, if people can't look to us and see Christ, what game are we playing? I, I think that in our desire to embrace the Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God that we don't just hold a posture that says we are willing to admit our mistakes. We've actually begun to embrace the inevitability of sin in our lives. We've begun to embrace a proclamation that sin is necessary for all humans. You see, that's not just admitting that you're going to make a mistake or that you have made mistakes. No, that's a proclamation of union. That is a declaration that you have become one with death through sin. That you have become so disciplined in the grammar of death that you could not think of living a life that didn't include sin. I'm sorry, but to that I say, stop sinning. To that I read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. In verses 12 through 14, Paul says, Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, obeying its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as a weapon of wickedness. Instead, Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law. You are under grace. What is Paul saying? Stop sinning. Because sin is union with death. But in Christ, we have died to our sin so that we can become united with God. Or another word for that is holiness. Now, 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 hear me very clearly. Hear me very clearly. This is not a call to perfectionism. This is not a call to legalism. 
Like the goal is not for you to become a legalist because all that legalism does is produces more rules and more brokenness, not holiness. This is not a call to perfectionism. This is a call to union with Christ. This is a call to become one flesh with the Spirit. This is a call that echoes 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, where it says, Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. This is a call to become truly human. You see, sin is not a prerequisite to be human. Sin is not a prerequisite to be human. To be human is not to sin. If that was true, then Jesus was never human. Because if to be human means to sin and Jesus never sinned, then, I mean, as a matter of fact, what we're basically saying is that Adam and Eve weren't truly human until they sinned in Genesis 3. And at that point, death is their creator and not God. No, to be, to be human is not to sin. In fact, to sin is to be less than human. To sin is to be less than human. Why? What is sin? Well, it wrestles with another question. What is sin wrestles with the question, what does it mean to be truly human? And to answer that question, we don't need to look to sin. We need to look to Christ. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. He gets it. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. You see, if Jesus was not truly human, then death was not truly conquered by God. Because in order for God to gain access to death, God had to become human, yet he was without sin. You see, Jesus was without sin, and that doesn't make him less human. In fact, that makes him more human than you and I have ever truly been. The call, then, is to transform through the Spirit, because in, in Christ, we can become whole and holy. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking right now. You're thinking, wait a minute. What in the world is this long-haired hippie talking about? Like, honestly, what is, he seems to be emphasizing our works a little bit too much. He seems to be emphasizing the things that we do. And my goodness, hasn't this professor heard Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, which says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, Shane. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, Shane. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Oh, works. The five-letter word that in the church comes across more like a four-letter word. You know, works. We just, ugh, we don't know what to do with works. We struggle with works. Works has this weird relationship with us where we, we want people to do works, but we don't want them to love works too much. You know what I mean? <laughs> First of all, let me say this. I agree with you. We are not saved by our works. There is one work that can save us, and that is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But this doesn't mean that works don't matter. This doesn't mean that then what you do or what you don't do doesn't matter at all. Here's the problem. The problem is we don't really know what works are. We don't know their place. We don't know where they fit. Typically, when you talk to people in the church, you say like, okay, well, then where do works fit? They'll say something along the lines of, it's our way of saying thank you to God, which which to me is kind of weird. I mean, if my wife gives me this uh, incredible gift of, of sacrificial love and says, Shane, I love you, none of you would think it wise for me to say, thanks, babe. Like, th that's not a wise way to go in our marriage. And frankly, it's not a wise way to engage theology. So where do works fit? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 is exactly right. We have been saved by grace. And grace is something that only God himself can do. Grace is a gift that only God himself can do. Grace is a movement of God toward us. But we have been saved by grace through faith. 
You see, faith is something that only we can do. Faith is our movement toward God because of his movement toward us. And notice what happens when God's grace moves towards our faith. We unite. We are saved by grace through faith. Or another way of saying it is we become one with God. The result is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, united with God through the Spirit. But then notice what Ephesians 2 10 then says. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Where do works fit? Works is birthed from our union with God. It's the natural outworking of our union with God. When grace moves towards us and we move towards God in faith, the natural outworking is works. You see, what I'm saying is this. Stop sinning. Instead, transform. Instead, become one with God. This is not a call to perfectionism. It's a call to union. It's a call to move toward God in faith because of his movement towards us in grace. Now listen, we don't begin this journey holy and perfect. We begin it broken and sinful. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, we get to follow Christ on a road paved with grace and patience. Grace and patience that lead us to our transformation, where holiness becomes our native tongue and sin becomes a distant memory. Kind of like an acorn and an oak tree. 